This is the second part of my series on signs in the Quran. The first part sparked some controversy, so I'm going to be spending a little time on that before I get into the one claim that is new to this video. Count4 posted a video response to my first video, claiming that he could not find any sources for many of my assertions in that video. Apparently, he has a Google deficiency. Anyway, I will be linking all of my online sources for this video in the comment box over on your right. There's no reason to make the mistake of assuming that Muslims can use Google twice. Note that some of these sources are Christian and specifically anti-Muslim, while others are general science articles. For the ones that are specifically anti-Muslim, I urge you to take this into account while reading. As for the Quran, as always, I will be quoting mainly the Pictal translation, which you can find in full with notes at the Skeptics Annotated Quran. I'll post a link to that in the video description as well. So, let's get cracking. In my previous video, I mentioned Aristotle and how he used the fact that the moon reflects sunlight to prove that the earth was a sphere, a ball, as it were. Now, some people apparently have a problem with the terms spherical and round. While their connotations are not the same when referring to the shape of the Earth, most people will use the terms interchangeably. It should be noted, however, that the Earth has almost always been portrayed as round, even when people believed it was flat. The flat earthers, as it were, still portrayed the Earth as circular. Round is an ambiguous term, so let's try to steer clear of that. I will use spherical and circular to describe the ball shape and the flat Earth respectively here. Aristotle used the fact that the moon reflected the light of the sun in his argument for a ball shape that is a spherical earth. The sources for this are linked in the comments section. Like it or not, this is a fact. But Aristotle wasn't the only Greek thinker to realize that the earth was spherical, or that moonlight was reflected light originating from the sun. He wasn't even the first. Already around 500 BC, Pythagoras, Pythagoras, I can't, exp I can't pronounce this shit. Anyway, the guy with the triangles proposed a spherical Earth. 240 BC, the Greek mathematician Erastathenes not only concluded the Earth was spherical, but also estimated its circumference to a high degree of accuracy. Now, to get back to the reflected light of the moon, a philosopher called Anaxagoras was imprisoned in 450 BC in Athens for claiming the moon reflected the light of the sun. 1100 years before Mohammed's first revelation, ladies and gentlemen. This later became less controversial, and several Greek philosophers and mathematicians, including Aristotle, used it in their arguments for their astronomical models. Next up, the Big Bang. The verse I quoted was Surah 21, Ayah 30. Another one apparently used for this purpose is 5147, which says, we have built the heaven with might, and we it is who make the vast extent thereof. This supposedly deals with redshift of light. Now those two verses, if interpreted to be about the Big Bang and its after effects, to me signify one thing. Allah didn't have the capacity to express himself clearly, so there could be no doubt. Hindsight is twenty twenty, and this is simply a bullshit interpretation. I hate to say it, but you're interpreting it in ways that the text simply cannot support. And now for the new stuff. A lot of Muslims responding to my original video said, well, if Mohammed copied all this stuff from Greek philosophers, why didn't he copy some of the things they got wrong as well? And that's a good question, but here's the kicker. He did. The new topic in this video is embryology in the Quran. This is probably the absolute favorite claim for Muslims, and it is based on many, many verses. I'm just going to read you one of them and mention a few more. You can find more, I'm sure. 23, 12 to 14, that's Surah 23, Ayah 12 to Ayah 14, reads, Verily we created man from a product of wet earth, then placed him as a drop of seed in a safe lodging, then fashioned we the drop a clot, then fashioned we the clot a little lump, then fashioned we the little lump bones, then clothed the bones with flesh, and then produced it as another creation. So blessed be Allah, the best of creators. Several other surahs mention this as well, notably 22.5 and 14.67. Anyway, let's look closely at the stages described here. 
First, a drop of seed. We must presume this means sperm. Then that forms into a clot, a clump of blood, basically. Then that is fashioned into bones, and finally flesh is formed around the bones. First of all, this is obviously wrong. It mentions nothing about the female contribution of the egg cell, and the bones are not formed before the flesh around them, but are actually formed within the flesh. So where did Mohammed get this? The answer shouldn't surprise anyone who's been keeping up. He got it from the Greeks. Galen, specifically, was a Greek physician who wrote much on this subject. The same goes for Hippocrates, who was also the originator of the Hippocratic Oath, and of what is probably the soundest principle in medicine to this date, to heal, or at least, to do no harm. Interestingly, these two physicians' descriptions of the development developing fetus correspond almost exactly with the description in Surah 23, Ayah 12 through 14. The same description of various phases of development and the same flaws in the specifics. So I think I'm actually running out of time here, so let's just wrap this up. In short, it's pretty clear that Mohammed, who was a merchant and thus presumably traded with lots of different people, had contact with some people well versed in the Greek classics and he used a lot of what he learned in the Quran. But even if you don't believe that was the case, at least it effectively buries the notion that he couldn't have gotten his so-called scientific facts from anyone but Allah. So I think I'll say mission accomplished, and wish you all a pleasant day. Peace.